Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Vietchner with Fortune, and today we're lucky to be joined by Vlad Tenev, who's the co-CEO of Robinhood, a uh, free trading platform. I wanted to start out um, by reading you a quote from this interview yesterday with the CEO of Charles Schwab, uh, who obviously I think is one of your uh, competitors, maybe one of the biggest competitors. Um, they have 11.1 brokerage accounts, I think you guys are at, uh, sorry, 11.1 million. million yeah. You guys are at something like four, four million plus. Um, so he was asked, uh, they recently lowered their commission trading fees from 8.95 to 4.95, and he was asking how that pricing model holds up today given the rise of Robinhood and other free trading platforms. And here's what he said. No one does trading for free. It's just a matter of how you're paying for it. If someone offers trading at a $0 commission price, then they're simply making it up in other manners. To say you're doing a trade for free is just disingenuous. If you're buying one share of Apple, maybe you don't care that your execution quality isn't the highest it could be. If you're buying 1,000 shares of Apple, you care a lot. So what do you say? Are, there, are people on Robinhood buying 1,000 shares of Apple? Uh, no, they're not. Uh... Well, maybe some are, but not, not that many. And thanks for having me again, by the way. It's really a, a pleasure to be, be here with you guys two years in a row. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things there with, with Walt's statement that we could, we could go into. One is just the first thing you pointed out. Um, yeah, if you're buying 1,000 shares of Apple, I mean, that's like a $200,000 transaction, right? And I, I agree that if you're making a $200,000 transaction, a 495 trade commission is um, is maybe not super relevant because that's just a, a very, very small percentage. But the fact is a very, very small percentage of people on this planet make $200,000 trading transactions in one go just like that. And uh, our focus has always been, uh, I mean, we, we've now moved on with more professional offerings for uh, traders that are more experienced, such as uh, free options and the multi-leg options announcement, but the bread and butter has always been mass market, and the mass market um, can't afford to, to be making $200,000 uh, $200, transactions like that. I think a typical transaction for someone that's just getting started or is at the beginning of their career where maybe they don't have the, the earning power as someone who's in their 50s or 60s, um, those transactions can be in the tens, hundreds of dollars, and at that point, a 495 commission um, is is very significant. It's double-digit percent of the total the total cost of that trade. And um, I think the, the other thing is that clearly there are companies offering free trading. I mean, we've launched with that uh, almost four years ago at this point, and we've expanded into uh, free options trading, commission-free crypto trading as well, and a lot of people didn't think these products would be would be possible either. Um, and when we launched free options trading, it surprised a lot of people in the traditional brokerage community because options is a big money maker. I mean, you get charged twice for every options trade, one for the transaction and then an additional per contract fee. So some of the more active traders are paying you know, hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars in commissions per day if they're if they're doing active options trading. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, we've we've dramatically lowered the cost um, across all three of these different products. Where frankly, customers were getting ripped off in the past, and making it up making up for it in other ways is also not accurate because companies operate at a certain margin, and what we've effectively done, if you kind of look at it top down, is we've compressed that margin by more than an order of magnitude. So we're still, we're still making money, we're just making a lot less of it um, than our competitors per customer, um, and we're making up for that with lots more customers, much more efficiency. Um, we don't operate fax machines, we don't use a lot of paper, um, whereas some of these legacy brokerages are running on paper and fax machines and have legacy mainframes that, that have been uh, sort of operating their business for, for many, many decades. So there's no catch here. He seems to imply that, you know, if you're giving trading away for free and they're not, then, you know, there's some uh, downside or, you know, some hidden fee or something like that. But you're saying 
really I mean, I think the, the, this business, in, in a sense, is about as transparent as, as, as it can be. I mean, you can deposit money, you can put in an order to buy stock, you can even put in a limit price, which um, uh, says, I don't wanna pay more than this amount per share of stock, and you can do the math yourself. Um, there's really not too many places that, that, that this can happen. And it's also a very, very highly regulated space. Um, and as a broker dealer, there's all sorts of regulations that we have to abide by that not just say that we have to uh, treat customers' uh, orders and, and route them and get them the best price, but we have to look at all possible market centers and exchanges and make sure the customer gets that price or even better. Um, so actually, customers through Robinhood are guaranteed to get at least as good of a price, if not better, than if they were to route directly to the exchanges. So if all that's true, I mean, do you think, Schwab, they say now they're not competing on price, but eventually, if, you know, as you grow, uh, you know, and as this market expands, do you think Schwab will be, you know, and others will be forced to get rid of commissions altogether? I mean, is that gonna go away? Uh, so you mentioned that they, they lowered their prices to, I think, $4.95. Um, and our assumption is that the industry is not going to stay still. Um, people are going to be forced to lower their prices in order to survive. So we're assuming everyone's going to going to going to try to to compete on price at some point um, because um, there's there's just a few things that customers really care about in financial services. They obviously care about uh, the customer experience and the ease of use and we, we compete, uh, we have really the best product in class in terms of those qualities, but they also really care about the price. I mean, you're, you're buying a financial instrument uh, and you're investing your money. A lot of that is, is, is driven by what type of fees you're paying. So if we do see this you know, competition on price, does that just mean that the brokerage industry becomes less profitable over time and it's never going to be you know, the kind of cash cow that it used to be? Um, I think that there's a couple of things that, that are going to happen when, uh, when, when the brokerages start lowering their prices. Um, one is that they're going to have to get more efficient, um, which is, is going to be challenging because they've been sort of operating under this principle that they can charge exorbitant fees for decades now, and that's just led to not the same focus on efficiency that a tech company would start out with. So if there was a, a manual process, um, there wouldn't be as much pressure to maybe automate that, to automate the back office, middle office, uh, front office functions, because they're making so much money off of each customer and the trading commissions and fees that, you know, why bother with that? They might as well just, you know, uh, basically set that process in stone, not touch it, and move on to other things. And that's been happening for many decades now that um, these companies aren't really technology companies or, or engineering companies. So they, they would have to get more efficient, um, which is, is gonna be very, very difficult for many reasons. Um, one of which is the technology is really hard to replace like that, especially if you've been building it up for, for decades. The other is it's going to require, um, you know, potentially laying off lots and lots of employees, um, and that's very tough. It's it's a very very hard thing to do, um, and it's hard to do when things are are going well as well because you kind of look at it and you say, um, why why would we do this? Like politically, it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, so that's going to have to happen, and. Um, they're gonna have to, the legacy players are gonna have to figure out how to attract the best talent. So right now, if you're uh, a really high quality computer science graduate or you're interested in going to, into a product role or maybe you're working at a Google or Facebook, you're not really considering a move to a discount brokerage or a bank as, uh, as a viable career move. Not a lot of people are, are making that type of transition and so, um, it's tough for these companies to get the top quality talent. Are you profitable right now, can you say? I can't talk about uh, our profitability, obviously, as a private company, um, but we've been growing really, really quickly. We've been uh, expanding into uh, different business lines, 
And um, I'm sure you've seen, but we closed a few months ago uh, our Series D round of financing. So the, the company is well capitalized to, to fuel our further expansion. Is a $363 million round valuing you guys at $5.6 billion, is that right? That's right, yeah. Do you guys have um, you know, any, any targets that come with that in ter in ter as far as you know, when you'd like to be profitable, I guess, or if you can't say, or you know, how many years maybe until uh, we could see an IPO, if that's the end goal? We don't have any targets. I mean, we're, we're obviously thinking about all these things on, um, on a regular basis, um, but the, the primary focus is just on rolling out new products and uh, building, building our customer base dramatically. It's over the past six months, uh, we've done a lot of those things, and you can see kind of where our focus lies. We were available only on mobile um, up until very recently, and we launched web in November, free options trading, like I mentioned, um, in December. And that's just been a, a massive uh, development. I mean, we've been growing so quickly. It's exceeded even our most optimistic, uh, optimistic projections about how well the options business could do. Um, and we're now already one of the largest options brokers in the world. And then free crypto, where we had over a million people join the wait list in the first couple of days. Um, so, yeah, if, if we think about things that could build value in, in our business, which is fundamentally a long-term business, um, we're sort of laser focused on, on new products and, and growth opportunities. Yeah, I know, you know, here last year we were talking about uh, the Snap, Snapchat IPO uh, and yeah. what a big trading day that was for you guys. I mean, I don't think we've had an IPO that's had as much hype since then. How has it, you know, have you seen any days like that? Um, you know, does anything compare since then? Yeah, that was a big day for us about a year ago uh, or a little bit over now. Um, I think the, uh, I mean, the business has been, has been growing organically um, and there are kind of, special days where we see a lot more growth than others, but I think now basically every day has as much activity, if not much more, than, than the day of the Snap IPO that we had over a year ago. Um, but the, the last one that I remember is probably when we announced crypto uh, toward the end of January. And uh, yeah, if, if you remember around that time, a lot of the big crypto exchanges and brokers were, uh, were basically not staying up. Uptime was a huge problem across the entire industry. I mean, the exchanges, the uh, big brokers were just down constantly for days at a time. And uh, we we're obviously looking into system stability and performance and reliability. And we had a couple of days where we were onboarding really, really large numbers of accounts. Um, Fortunately, the system stayed up um, and uh, we sort of like uh, provisioned well and planned for it um, and we were able to, to, to sustain the, the orders and the customer interest throughout those times. What's a large number of accounts? Like what would be a big day for you? A big day, I mean, anything that's in the hundreds of thousands a big day. So you've had that more yeah. than 100,000 you know, or even 200,000 accounts added in a single day? Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, speaking of crypto, I mean, again, last year on stage, I you know, asked you if you'd been thinking about getting into crypto cur cr cryptocurrency trading at all, and you said we're looking at it. And at the time, I didn't really you know, yeah. think much of it because so was everybody else. I mean, Bitcoin and Ethereum were going crazy you know, on the news all the time. Everyone was kind of looking at it. But you know, then uh, you know, come January, you guys kind of came out of nowhere and announced this. So take me through you know, what changed from we're looking at it to we're gonna do this, um, and from what I understand, you guys turned it around in like six weeks or something like that, six, seven weeks. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess you, you, you really broke that story <laughs> about a year ago, so kudos to you on that. Um, uh, I think it was, a lot of things changed toward the end of last year. I think uh, with the price running up, there was also a surge of interest, um, and we saw a lot of interest from our customers in, in trading these assets. We could track that a number of ways. One is obviously people writing into customer support and saying, uh, why don't you guys offer Bitcoin and, and Ethereum? The other is we can look at what people are searching for and the searches that don't lead people to an instrument page or a stock page on our platform are really informative because it shows customer intent that we're not fully satisfied. And for a while it was just kind of like, 
um, foreign stocks that we don't offer on the platform. And I think we, we also spoke about um, uh, around the time that Pokemon Go was a big thing, people were searching for Nintendo on the platform, which is not a US listed stock, so we weren't offering that. Um, but around the end of last year, we saw Bitcoin and, and Ether were basically an order of magnitude more searched than, than anything else. Um, and so we realized that uh, the use case for these, these products right now is as an investment. And that's really very much in line with what we're good at and what we offer. So um, yeah, we decided to prioritize it and sort of put it to the, at the front of the roadmap in December. And um, yeah, basically like worked really hard over the holidays and announced it at the end of January. Um, and it was really cool because we, we had posters up on the office. Everyone was really sort of motivated to get this out because we had a lot of people that were just passionate about the space um, and saw that we could deliver a really great product. And I think um, we ended up doing that. I think uh, if you look at cryptos, people are paying exorbitant fees right now you know, four or 5% fees on every transaction. And it's, it's very similar uh, to brokerage before we sort of came in there and, uh, and lower the fees quite dramatically. Um, so um, yeah, it's very in line with our mission to take this thing which is very, very expensive and where customers are being price gouged and, and lower it to zero. And I think you're in about 16 states right now with, with crypto, not yet New York, uh, where right. we are here. Um, any expectations or anything you can share about when you might come to New York? With uh, this? We're, we're very interested in, in making this available everywhere, especially in New York. I mean, we've got a lot of customers uh, in the New York area that, that use Robinhood for equities and options and uh, a lot of interest here for crypto as well. So. Um, we're basically making it available as, as soon as we can. And that involves working with regulators and making sure we have all the licensing and, and that we're as compliant as possible in every way. So uh, you need a bit license focus. Uh, yeah. yeah, to come here. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking of, you know, the other crypto exchanges are charging four to 5% commissions, you're charging nothing. Um, but also from what I understand, I mean, revenue's business model, you make money from uh, Robinhood Gold, which is the margin trading. That's um, right. And then you also collect interest on cash and stock-based assets. That's right. So with crypto, how does that fit in? I mean, are you able to make money on, you know, crypto trading or is it just something that, you know, feeds the, the volume in other areas? Yeah, the, the primary goal with the crypto business is to just uh, get people into the overall ecosystem. So we're intending to break even on that business um, for the foreseeable future. But what we've actually seen a lot of is people hearing about us through crypto, then opening accounts and investing in equities and, and options, upgrading to Robinhood Gold, people that are really into crypto, uh, also discover all these other instruments and assets and, and become uh, sort of customers of the entire Robinhood ecosystem. So when you launched also the crypto trading, it was in the midst of a sell-off. I mean, uh, Bitcoin is down about, uh, you know, more than 50%, um, it's almost 70% now, since you actually made the decision to, to get into this. Did that come as a surprise for you? Did it shake your confidence at all in, um, gosh, maybe we really picked the t wrong time to get into this? Um, well, actually, I think it would have been much worse if we had gotten into it a couple of months earlier and, you know, right when it was at 20,000. I think that um, it's, it's actually better in a lot of ways to, to get in after sort of the hysteria and the hype has died down a little bit. Um, but from sort of a, a business strategy standpoint, we didn't get into the space because we wanted to catch sort of a rapid upswing. We got into it because um, we believe in the potential and we see that this asset has staying power, like significant staying power. And this type of thing that happened in uh, late last year, early this year, has actually happened multiple times in the past, right? You look back at uh, 2013, you know, 2014, where the price ran up to 1,000 or 1,300, maybe almost 2,000 before before decaying. Um, so if you kind of look at the history of, of Bitcoin prices, it's, it's very fractal in a way. So uh, 
I don't think, I think it would be foolish to, to say that, you know, Bitcoin is, is done. I don't think uh, a lot of people can really honestly say that they're confident in that. And when we made the decision, it was very much long-term focused in that uh, we want to invest in this business and we want to be, be there as a market leader over, uh, over a time span of decades. So we don't really worry about uh, where the price is at any given moment any more than we worry about prices of any of the individual uh, 8,000 or so or, or more instruments that are, that are being traded on the platform. Do you own or trade any cryptocurrencies yourself? So I, I mean, I obviously use Robinhood, uh, the product, uh, all the time. Um, I mean, mo most of my personal, uh, I guess, uh, holdings are, are in the form of, of Robinhood stock. So, I mean, any, anything else is kind of just product testing and, and using it in that way. Okay, so now that you have, I mean, so you, you've attracted these new cryptocurrency enthusiasts to the platform, and you said there's some crossover between uh, the stock traders getting to crypto, crypto traders getting into to stocks. I guess, have you seen you know, or noticed any um, you know, patterns in the behavior, or have you learned anything? Um, I mean, you have a lot of millennials uh, you know, in your, you know, as your demographic, I believe. You know, what, are, what are you seeing um, in terms of how they hold up uh, when you do have tech sell-offs? I mean, not just cryptocurrency, but we've seen with stocks um, a lot yeah. of volatility this year, too. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question because that's something that initially surprised us a lot. Um, I mean, we launched in uh, March of 2015, and probably about six months after we launched, uh, it was August of 2015, there was a, a big volatility spike um, the markets went down one day by, I think, 4%. Four, uh, 4 and uh, we were just freaking out, right? We were, like, our servers were crashing. This was very early on. Like, uh, customers were trying to trade, and, you know, it wasn't our finest day in, in terms of uh, system stability. And uh, we, we were up and running. We got everything operational. We, we sort of... Uh, fixed everything, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, things had completely recovered, and then we kind of took a breath and looked at the numbers, and what we saw really surprised us. We had a record day of new signups, record deposits. People were depositing uh, large amounts of money into the platform, and a record number of buys as well. And that surprised us because, um, like, what we've always heard is, if markets are bad or there's volatility, customers will run away and pull their money out. Um, and what, what we were seeing here was the opposite. People were viewing this as an opportunity to actually invest more money into the market. And we've seen that happen time and time again. And my, my hypothesis is that this is really a uh, behavior difference between customers that are at the early part of their investing career and customers that are close to retirement. And so if you're a customer that's closer to retirement and you see a big volatility day, it can be quite frightening because you have a lot of money uh, that's invested and you're seeing these large fluctuations and uh, you know, this is kind of your nest egg, right? But if you're early in your career, you see decades, uh, you see sort of a, a decade long time horizon, multiple decades, and so these fluctuations um, are good opportunities to, to buy. So customers view those days as, as good buying opportunities. Yeah, so quick question here. Um, so you guys, uh, you just mentioned you have, you have three products that you've launched just since November. Yeah. You have a $5.6 billion valuation. You have fewer than 200 employees. Uh, when Stripe, uh, which I think is the largest private fintech company, mm -hmm. um, had a $5 billion, value at $5 billion valuation uh, in 2016, they had twice as many employees as you. Right. What's your top? You know, what would you say is the, your secret or, or your, the most important piece of advice you have for squeezing productivity out of a relatively small workforce? Yeah, that's, um, that, that's a tough one. You know, I, I think we've always been very frugal. It's one of, our, one of our core company values to be frugal and you know, not, not waste money on sort of unnecessary things. We also really like to start things out um, sort of with low resources. So what would be very, very antithetical to Robinhood is um, like hiring hundreds of people to begin a new business division. Um, 
or making a huge capital investment of any kind without sort of proving that, that it works on a small scale. So in, in sort of adopting this model, um, we, we force ourselves to, to be leaner than, than other companies because we like to start things out very, very small and invest in them as they, as they grow bigger very, very organically. Um, and I think that frugality as, as a big value plus uh, sort of this approach to new products has been, um, has been effective. And it also comes down to the people. I mean, Stripe, Stripe has fantastic people, obviously, and they're also quite small given the company value. Um, but if you look at a lot of these uh, legacy players in financial services, I mean, they have, you know, uh, they, they, they don't, typically hire the most high growth, high potential talent, um, with exceptions. Obviously, there's great people there as well, but um, our goal is always to have a small number of really, really talented people than you know, a large number of mediocre or, or less talented people. So we're pretty much out of time, but just to do a quick lightning round of this overrated, underrated game. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read them. You say over and underrated, and then just one, you know, quick reason why. Okay, that's fun. New York Stock Exchange. Uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I would say underrated. Underrated. Okay. Um, I think the New York Stock Exchange has a great brand, and people tend to uh, not really realize the 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 value of that. Okay. Cool. I mean, from a historical perspective, it's it's hard to beat the brand of the of the New York Stock Exchange. Next one, Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are in a bit of a rivalry. <laughs> oh, that's that's a tough one. I mean, Coinbase. Uh, it's it's hard to say because that can be kind of construed as uh, as uh, as how I think the company is going to do. I think the company has done quite well. They've brought a lot of people into this space, um, but like a lot of the players. Um, the fees are really high. So uh, overrated? <laughs> <laughs> Fidelity. Um, <laughs> oh, this it is not, you're, you're, you're killing me here. Um, uh, look, I think Fidelity is, uh, I mean, Fidelity, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how about we don't we don't really have anything against Fidelity. I think they do, they do they have reasonable products, um, but yeah, they're a legacy player and they they hire a lot of people and they're not really uh, they're not really a technology company. They're very very different than us. One more Ethereum, overrated, underrated. <laughs> uh, uh, that's also a really tough one because I can't. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to uh, to to speak about different assets. Um, How about blockchain in general? Um, I think blockchain as a concept has sort, of, uh, has sort of become a little bit overrated because people are creating companies with the specific goal of sort of latching onto the, the blockchain hype. Um, and I really think there's only been a couple of actual use cases that, uh, that have proved out in blockchain so far. So I think there are, there's a lot of things that people are trying to latch blockchain onto that don't really need you know, decentralized, distributed ledgers um, where databases would be fine. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say there's a, there's a slight amount of overrated there. All right, well, that's it, everyone. Thank you guys so much, and thank you so much, Vlad, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.